Our lesson tonight is more faith and less fear. More faith and less fear. A couple of Sunday nights ago we talked about anxiety, and you can separate fear and anxiety to some extent, but they are a lot alike, aren't they? And it is a fear of something that causes anxiety in most cases, although there are some floating anxieties. But a strong faith in Jesus can be such a powerful deterrent to those. So this is sort of like a B part to that particular lesson a couple of Sunday nights ago, but it is a separate one with different material. But uh, Matthew chapter 8 is a powerful story on faith if we look at the beginning part of the chapter. Uh, it starts out uh, where Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 8, in verse uh, 5, rather, Jesus had entered Capernaum and a centurion came to him and pleading with him. Of course, centurions, you know, are, were in charge of like 100 soldiers. And as we all, often point out, centurions are looked upon in good light in the Word of God. Uh, they know of maybe four, maybe three, I'm not sure. This one may be the same one who was at the, the foot of the cross who said surely this was a righteous man in reference to Jesus, but possibly a separate centurion. So those were two real good guys. And then you had also uh, Cornelius, who was really a wonderful person in Acts chapter 10. Of course, he's heads the list of all good centurions, doesn't he? And then the man who was in charge, Julius, in charge of Paul, as Paul was uh, imprisoned and going through his journeys and uh, the ship and shipwreck and all those things. And so <clears throat> those were, these were all good men. Uh, they're smart men. These are men who were, were intelligent enough. They were in a supervisory situation, uh, probably a lot like a master sergeant in an army. And so they, this man uh, came pleading with Jesus, and he said, My servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now that, that appeals to me when he says that. Uh, this is not the same situation as we would have like in John 4 where you had the man whose uh, son was dying, the nobleman's son dying. Now, I can understand about a son, uh, but a servant, you know, he was that attached to his servant and loved his servant, had a great respect for him. Reminds us of the love that the little maiden had for Naaman back in 2 Kings 5. And it bothered him that he was hurting so very much in such great pain. So he wanted something to be done to help him out. And so Jesus said, I will come and heal him. It's interesting in, in John 4, the one I just mentioned before, and this can spin you off in different directions. Uh, he said, I'm going to stay here and you go your way. But in this case, he said, I'll go over there and visit with him. I'm going to make a house call on this one. And then he was doing that, I, I believe, because he knows so much about the faith of man and what's in man. And so the centurion said, no, I, you know, you don't need to do that. I'm not even worthy that you should come under my roof. But I only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And then he says, I, I know a little bit about authority. He said, I'm a man of authority. I, I know about that. I have soldiers who are under me. And I can tell this one go and he goes, another one come and he comes and my servant do this and he does it. Well, Jesus knew right where the man was going. He knew that this person was wise enough that he understood about who Jesus was and the authority Jesus had. And he understood that his minuscule authority compared to the Lord's just wasn't very much. But he did understand the subject of authority. And so Jesus uh, gives him an example of authority. And so he said, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I'm telling him, well, we'll skip verse 11 and 12 for right now. But 13, he said to the centurion, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. And the servant was healed that same hour. We're talking about faith. Well, if Jesus could understand, could recognize faith, and he certainly could, we expect him to be the chief of all individuals when it came to faith, and he was. And so as he was talking to his disciples and he was sorrowfully ready to depart from them, he points out that the hour is coming, in fact it's here now, he said, that you're going to be scattered, each to his own. And not only that, you'll leave me alone. But I'm going to tell you I'm not really alone. I'm not alone because my Father is with me. John 16, verse 32. This same Jesus said, You can cheer up because I've overcome the world. You have peace through me. You'll have tribulation, but I've overcome the world. 1 John 5, 4 and 5 teaches us about how our faith can help us overcome the world. And what a wonderful thing to think about increasing our faith as each day goes by, as we're on this wonderful journey of living the Christian life. And having a stronger faith helps us to do a better job with those enemies such as anxiety and fear. And no doubt all of us have experienced fear in our life, whether it's a real or whether it's imagined. 
And it can be like some forms of anxiety. It can be a giant in our life and really be a debilitating thing for us and against our wishes of trying to serve God in the best way that we should. And uh, we believe as Christians, understanding Jesus better, having a stronger faith can cause us to be able to do better in dealing with that particular problem that we all must face in different areas. I have a feeling everyone's afraid of something and uh, there are some things, some things we ought to be afraid of. And the first thing we want to do with our lesson tonight is identify the fear we ought to have, then the one we shouldn't have, and what we can do about it through Jesus and through the faith that we have in Him. And we'll spend a few minutes looking at that. First of all, fear defined, <clears throat> according to American Heritage Dictionary, a feeling of agitation and anxiety caused by the presence or imminence of danger. Now, there's a secondary definition, though, and that's the first one we want to focus in on, and that is extreme reverence or awe as toward a supreme power. That's the right kind of fear. And that right kind of fear is addressed in many situations in the Word of God. We're told, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And that's all based upon God who wills and who works in our life, if you'll notice the next verse following that. Also, Matthew 10, 28, that we are not to fear anyone who could hurt our body but not destroy our soul. We can to fear him who can destroy or should fear him who could destroy both body and soul in hell. And we understand that. Uh, we know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And let me just read some of the things about Proverbs, what it says. This is so interesting about fear, what it says. The fear of the Lord will cause you to hate evil. In our life, we want to approximate into our spirit the same hatred of evil that God has. If we could have that, we would sure be doing well, wouldn't we? And so we strive to do that. The fear of the Lord prolongs our life. How about that? Proverbs 10, 27. That doesn't mean that every person who dies young didn't fear the Lord, but just as it is the case in Ephesians chapter 6 that when a person is obedient to their parents, they, uh, they, things go well with them and they can have a long life on this earth. They generally do the things that can cause their life to be a better life and a longer life. It even provides confidence and is the fountain of the life. The fear of the Lord is, Proverbs 14, 26 and 27. Causes us to want to run away from evil, Proverbs 16, 6. Causes us to have a satisfying life and spares us from a lot of evil. Proverbs 19, 23. How, how much more practical can you get than that? That's so practical, isn't it? As a Christian, because of making the right choices, uh, you know, you, you don't always see every time you make a right choice, you know, here are ten things that could have gone wrong if I'd have gone another direction. But you just look all around you and you just watch pieces and bits of mistakes falling down like snowflakes or raindrops from all these individuals who are walking in the way of the devil. And then you walk in the way of the Lord and look how many pitfalls you avoid. Look how many snares and traps you stay away from just because you live the Christian life. Uh, Proverbs 22.4 even leads you to riches, honor, and life. Maybe not materially speaking, but certainly spiritually speaking. The uh, value of fearing God, I like how it was expressed by a fellow named Chambers. He said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. And if you don't fear God, you fear everything else. I think that makes a lot of sense. The best fear, the most important fear, is how horrible it would be to lose God in my life. I don't want that to happen, and you don't want that to happen either. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Peter puts his own twist on fear and the importance of a reverential fear. Turn with me if you want to there just for a minute. We'll take a look at that. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. In that particular passage, let me get to 1 Peter, and I'll do better than 2 Peter on that. 1 Peter 1, 17. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay and King James says sojourning, here in fear. Now, why should we have that, Peter? Why, why do I want to live in fear or awe or reverence of God? Peter says, I'm glad you asked, because I'm going to give you three reasons why you should. First of all, he says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Some things cost more, thing, more than others do. And when we look at our soul, 
it cost a lot. Salvation is free, and we thank the good Lord for that, but that doesn't mean it didn't cost. It cost the life's blood of our Savior. And so when I see how much it cost, you know, oh, just the Son of God, just Him dying on the cross, I'd best not trample that Son of God underfoot and do despite to God's grace and look at the covenant by which I've been sealed and saved as something that's an unholy thing. I realize I don't need to sin willfully, Hebrews 10, verse 26. And so that makes a great impression on me, and it causes me to have a reverential fear of God. You also notice another thing, said he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. This plan of redemption that God has put together for me was not something that just he threw together at the last minute. You know, as it's been said by some before, that the Jews surprisingly rejected Jesus. And so God said, I don't know what to do now, so I guess I'll just go ahead and create the church through him. Not at all. Or I heard a person say one time, and this is only for those who understand about football, God did not call an audible at the line of scrimmage and say, oops, I never thought in terms about how this wouldn't work right and the Jews wouldn't like Jesus, so I guess we'll just let him die on the cross and somehow make that all work together for good. Not at all. Because this was planned out from the beginning of time, Revelation 13, 8, I see the seriousness of it all causes me to have respect for God. And another thing is in verse 17. I call on the Father who without partiality judges everyone according to their works. And so God will be the honest and righteous judge. And so if I have not measured up to the task, if I've not lived the faithful life, I will not get to hear those words. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But instead it will be the sad and dismal words of, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire. So I want to have a fear of God. And I need to have a fear of God. He deserves that. He deserves to have a fear given as far as respect and honor and reverence toward him. Because this is a powerful God. This is a powerful God who doesn't joke around. I've uh, heard it said before that some people treat like God like he's some type of elderly grandfather trying to babysit you. You know, if you had an elderly grandfather who might be in his 80s or 90s, and here he is trying to watch out for little boys that might be 12 or 14 or 16 years old, and of course that might be more like a great-grandfather in that situation, those boys could do about anything they want to, couldn't they? I mean, they can run faster than he can run. They're probably even stronger than he is. Some of them might be. Well, God is not that way. He's not an elderly grandfather. Look what he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what he would do with uh, Abiram and Dathan and Korah and those individual of Korah as they were rebellious against Moses and against Moses' leadership. Look what he did concerning the uh, Uzziah as he was uh, turned, he had leprosy that was placed upon him. Look at Uzzah as he reached out to study the ark and then as he studied the ark, then he perishes. Look at Lot's wife. Look at the, uh, the death that occurs to the firstborn uh, the 10th plague concerning Egypt with Israel was about to be released. You're looking at a powerful God. A God, and it says in Hebrews chapter 10, that it's, uh, you don't want to fall into the hands of this angry God. You don't want to do that. It's a frightening thing, a horrifying thing to do that very thing. So, so we realize that we should have that kind of fear. But then there's the wrong kind of fear. Now, I know that You've all wanted to know what some of the top fears are that people have in this world, haven't you? And that's just one of the benefits you're going to get from this lesson tonight. From research that has been done, and it didn't take a long time to do this, uh, there was a poll that had been conducted, talks about people's top 12 fears. And if we were just in a class, we could go around the room and guess some of those, but we're not. We're in a sermon. So the number one fear... 40% of people who were polled said they were actually afraid of speaking in front of a group. Can anybody identify with that? Uh, I can't understand that. No, I can't understand that. I, I first started preaching. It was only because I didn't know how to get out of it. My brother was the preacher in the family, and so they couldn't get him. He was already preaching full time, so they said, well, he's got a little brother. We'll call him. I bet he'll preach for us. And so they did. I went with fear and trembling. My very first lesson was entitled, I Was Afraid. How very appropriate. So I can understand that. Then there are people who are afraid of heights, insects and bugs, financial problems, I'm afraid of those. Deep water, and that goes along with financial problems, doesn't it? But disease and death, probably everybody afraid of that. Flying, uh, loneliness, of course, you know, uh, you see how that would be something people are actually frightened of. Dogs, depends on how they bark and how big they are for me. 
and then driving or riding in a car, and that depends on who's driving, you know. And then also darkness is one of those things, and every one of them have a name associated with it. I wouldn't even try to name those names. It doesn't matter. But uh, those kind of things you, you might be able to relate to, but, but I'd like to get a little further, than, a little bit deeper in the lesson than something along those things. Those are kind of surface things in many ways. But uh, I imagine that, that we all have dealt with fear that have caused the types of fears that have caused us not to do the Lord's work as well as we would like to in some way. Uh, probably we can appreciate that. I want to share with you one that happened in my life last summer just as an illustration. Uh, last summer as we were preparing to go to Jamaica, uh, all set, ready to go, Brandon was going to be going with me. And I was thankful the elders uh, had uh, put up enough money to allow me to be able to go on that trip. I was grateful for that trust they had in me to do that. And uh, as we were preparing for that, about five days before time, uh, time for us to leave, an unbelievable, horrifying accident occurred in Cleveland, Tennessee, associated with the very congregation that was heading up our campaign where a 19-year-old young man was killed in a horrifying automobile accident. Uh, his dad was one of the campaign directors, typically. He did so much work with the work in Jamaica. And it absolutely stultified uh, all of our feelings. I don't know that anybody even wanted to talk about a campaign the next week. And as we were there at the funeral service and then uh, following that, the cemetery, and watching that situation where this young man is uh, interred into the earth and that 19 year old who had life just brimming inside of him with so many incredible things he could have done. I'm sure that if anyone would have walked up to us and especially the campaign director who was there and would have said, let's just call it off this year. Every one of us would have said, okay, I think our heart is not in it. We just don't have what it takes. We went anyway, devil had another plan. And that was a hurricane. I can't even tell you which one. We had so many last year, I don't know which one it was. It slammed into Jamaica, and uh, it slammed into Jamaica the day before we were supposed to arrive there. We went there anyway. The campaign was, after we arrived, called <coughs> off. And so we were given tickets or to go back out on Monday and fly back home. Brethren, I'm going to tell you I couldn't wait to get on that airplane because yet another hurricane was heading that way also, that very place, same place. And the next weekend it was coming that way. But it didn't take long after I got home till I realized I feel like the old devil won some real big victories against us right there and against the Lord. We should have stayed. We should have stayed and we should have worked there. Later on when I talked to a man who had been a campaign director on other campaigns, I said, Dave, what would you have done? He said, well, I would have figured that there probably still was some work we could have done and why not just go ahead and stay there for a week and do the Lord's work. Good point there. I wish that's what we would have done now. I feel like the devil was stronger than we were, and we let him win. And I bet that probably in your life you may have had experiences like that too, where you feel like that you wanted to do right, but you just got afraid something was frightening to you. Or maybe you're not that way. Maybe you were a stalwart, powerful, a great example of faith, and you've never had an experience like that. That's great, and I'm very proud of you. But probably a lot of us can identify with fear. Uh, fear. Someone said it's false education appearing real. It makes sense, doesn't it? Makes the wolf bigger than he is. Makes man believe the worst. If you fear death, you can't enjoy life. And if you live in fear, you'll never be a free man. And someone said fear is the sand in the machinery of life. I think that makes sense. I thought our young people would be back. We have some here tonight, but I wanted to mention this next thing just for them. In a poll of teenagers, among other things they feared, 44% feared failing in school. Uh, now this one gets me, 33% feared loneliness. And at first I might be inclined to say, well, I don't know about that. How can any young person be afraid of loneliness? But on one occasion I had the opportunity to speak at the Maple Hill Church of Christ in Lebanon, Tennessee for a summer series. And my topic that was assigned was loneliness. Uh, I'd never done a lesson on loneliness until then. And I asked for a show of hands, how many here have ever been lonely? And you know everybody in that congregation raised their hand. I'm talking young people, older people, everybody had been lonely in their life. And so young people can identify with that too. 33% of them said that. Uh, not having a boyfriend or girlfriend, 30%, or just plain old rejection, 28%. I remember that thought about the rejection thing. I, I didn't want to stand out as being different from my friends. I, you know, I, I knew that there were words that I could not use and things I could not do because I was a Christian, 
But I didn't go around uh, saying a whole lot of things about that a lot of times because I didn't want to stand out as being this oddball, this different guy. And so I can see how that would be. Well, with that happening, then the devil has a lot of ways he can use that and can cause people to do the wrong things, get in with the wrong crowd, cheat, uh, improper sexuality. Uh, different things can happen in adult years as well. Uh, cheating on the job, adultery, unscriptural marriages, and so forth. Fear of rejection, fear of persecution. Some people have denounced their faith in God eventually because of that. It has an eroding effect upon our faith. And so what we want to do then in, in the last part of our lesson is just notice how faith in Jesus can be helpful to us when it comes to overcoming fear. Uh, first of all, Jesus just lets you know immediately. And I, I'm not comfortable with this because he would be saying this to me directly. He is saying it to me directly. If I were working with him as one of his apostles, I can hear the words of Jesus being said toward me because I don't think I would have been any different than those disciples would have been. But he lets them know that their fear meant they did not have the right kind of faith they should have. In Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27, since we were already there in Matthew 8, you may still have your Bibles open to that. He got into a boat. His disciples followed him. A great tempest arose on the sea. Uh, the only thing probably floating much at that time was a bunch of icebergs for him to walk on, right? I'm sorry, that's way out of line. So that the boat was, over, was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. The disciples came to him and awoke him. And you know this parallels with the same story in Mark 4, of course, the same story. And so uh, they awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And that's when he said, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? And he arose, he rebuked the winds and the sea. There was a great calm. The men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? And Jesus said to them in verse 26, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And so if you take that negative connotation, fear is like a faith. And I could have spun that thing around and said, your faith has caused you not to be fearful. And so they wouldn't have worried about things like that, would they? After all, they were riding with Jesus. They were right there with him. Oh, the same thing happens again if you go in Matthew 14. In Matthew 14, 25 through 33, I love this story. This is uh, an incredible story about Simon Peter as he was walking on the water. And I have to admire him. Don't you admire Simon Peter sometimes? He, he sure does fall down a lot. He's like that athlete I was hearing, seeing a commercial about today, uh, Dwayne Wade. It says, fall down seven times and get up eight. And that's kind of what Peter did. He fell down seven times and got up eight. He never would quit, would he? Well, he fell tonight. Uh, Matthew 14, 25 through 33. It was the fourth watch of the night. That's the uh, witching hours is what we call that in the security business. It's a time when it's gloomy and frightening, not much activity is going on, everybody's sound asleep, and it's creepy out there. So it was the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out for fear. Now that gets you already off to a scary start, doesn't it? And immediately Jesus said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out, to come to you on the water. Uh, what Jesus did here was he called his bluff. He called his bluff. I don't know if Peter was thinking that maybe he'll just say, oh, you're not ready for that. Or not just give me a second, I'll be there with you all in the boat. But <laughs> Jesus said some words I don't think Peter wanted to hear. Come, come on. All right, here you go. And boy, he got out of the boat walked on the water to go to Jesus. When he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. He knew who to go to, didn't he? And Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I wonder how Jesus said that. I wonder how he said it. I, I feel like he probably didn't say it with a lot of anger or anything toward Peter, but he just let him know your, your faith fell and because of your fear. If you had more faith, less fear. More fear caused less faith. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus touched on the thing that all of us worry about, probably, or one time or another we have, and that is dealing with what about tomorrow, or how will I get by, and what about food and clothes, and what about money and salaries and whatnot. And so in Luke 12, 37, 27 through 32, using some different passages tonight, because normally you'd want to go to Matthew 6, Probably that'd be the first place you'd go to. 
But if you look at Luke 12, 27 through 32, you're talking about the same thing that was going on there. When he says, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God clothes the grass, which today is in the field, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after your Father knows that, what, that you need these things. <clears throat> seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Wonderful, wonderful teaching right there. Uh, someone put it, fear is simply unbelief parading in disguise. I think that's right. If Jesus is going to supply us as the great supplier to help us be equipped to have a greater faith, then one of the jobs he would have to have as the Son of God would be to deal with the things that we probably would be most concerned about here on this earth. What are we most concerned about? Fear of speaking in public, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time worrying over that. Darkness, didn't worry a lot about that, although he's the light of the world. Didn't talk a lot about insects and bugs, did he? Didn't worry over things like that or heights or things like that. But he did deal with some really pressing issues. First of all, the fear of what we might face in this life. What's coming up tomorrow or next week? What I may have to deal with, whatever that might be. What am I going to do about whatever that might be? And I could go around this room tonight and I'll tell you every one of you all have something in mind that you may be thinking about that could be a little bit, maybe a little problem, maybe a big problem that's out there. Maybe a bump in the road, maybe a big, big gully washer there in the middle of the road that you're going to have to cross somehow. Uh, but it's out there. There's something out there. So what do we do about something like that? What are you going to do for me there, Jesus? What about my faith now? How are you going to work with me? Here's how you work with me. Matthew 28, verse 20. I'm with you always, even to the end of this age. Jesus will be with me. Many of us here were fortunate enough to have a big brother. Big brothers can sometimes be annoying. They fight with you. They get you down, put different types of holes on you. Uh, my brother did one hold on me called the Japanese claw. He learned it from Tojo Yamamoto up in uh, uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and it hurt really bad. But I also loved him very much and still do, seven years older than me. And so there would be some nights I would have the assignment that I needed to go to my grandfather's house, which was only, oh, about 100 yards or so up the road. But if it was nighttime, that was so scary. There were ghosts and goblins and spooks and all kinds of frightening creatures that were dwelling between my home and my grandfather's home. Not one street light, nothing like that had been heard of back in that day and time. And so uh, scary, really scary. But there was some assignment I had. I needed to go do that. And how I loved it when my brother would speak up and say, hey, I'll go with you, knucklehead, or something like that. Just anything along that line. And whatever name he called me didn't make any difference because what he was telling me was he was going with me. And suddenly what was going to be a frightening, horrifying journey was pretty fun. <laughs> well, it wasn't that bad at all. So it is when Jesus goes with me. How does that song say? If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. And so that's what gives me a blessing. No wonder Joshua had such courage in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, because he knew God was with him and would be with him. And with the Lord at our side, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, what can man really do to really hurt me? Nothing at all, because he is my helper. And then there's the fear of death. Probably most people have the fear of death. So what do we do about that? What are you going to do about that, Jesus, if you're going to equip me concerning my faith so that I won't have such fear along that line? Well, his own victory over death, that's a big plus, isn't it? As we talked about the resurrection this morning, through death he destroyed him who had the power of death, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Now you look at Paul, the apostle, he wasn't a worry wart, was he? No, he said, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. He pointed out that it would be good for him to be able to stay here and do the ministry he was involved in, yet he had a desire to go on and be with Jesus Christ. And I don't think he worried much about it. And then what's going to happen after death? That's a frightening thing. After I close my eyelids in death, what will then occur? Jesus deals with that as well. In John 14, 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. 
I said one through three, and I think I did a little bit more than that, but that's okay. And that whole thing is telling us in John chapter 14, don't worry about it. My Father has all kinds of room for you to live there with Him, and He's invited you to come, and I've invited you to come, and so I want you to be with me. We will take care of you after death. No wonder Paul was triumphant in his speech in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, basically is what it says in the original language. I fought my fight, I finished the faith, I've kept, or I've kept the faith, finished my course and kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me of that day, not to me only, but to all them who also love his appearing. And so when we have that type of understanding, Jesus takes care of me now. He takes care of me as far as not having to worry about death. He takes care of me when it comes to what will happen after death. I'm trying to think. What else is there out there to worry over? Not much, is there? That just about takes care of the whole thing. And it's all centered around faith. Where faith is, fear cannot abide. Feed your faith, your fear is starved to death. And like someone wrote, fear knocked at the door, faith answered, nobody was there. Fear and faith can't keep house together when one enters, the other one departs. Harry Emerson Fosdick contrasted fear and faith this way. He said, fear imprisons, faith liberates. Fear paralyzes, faith empowers. Fear disheartens, faith encourages. Fear sickens, faith heals. Fear makes useless, faith makes serviceable. And most of all, fear puts hopelessness at the heart of life while faith rejoices in its God. We rejoice in our Savior and have faith in Him. Look at the miracles He did. Look at also the resurrection of our Savior. Look at the words of His apostles that they wrote. And also we realize that with what we have with Jesus, with him living with us and dwelling with us every day of our life, we have everything to be happy for. We indeed are the most fortunate people in the world. You remember Lou Gehrig's statement as he said, I'm the luckiest man alive. We're the luckiest, and I wouldn't say luckiest, most fortunate people alive because luck is kind of like happenstance. But we are the most fortunate people alive because we have walked hand in hand with Jesus, put our hand in his nail-scarred hand, and one day that Jesus will take us home. As we're treading through the waters of Jordan and our eyelids close in death, I would like to think the next voice we hear is, it is I, do not be afraid, and we can go home and be with the Lord. That's what we have as Christians. Aren't we fortunate for that? This evening, though, if you've not obeyed the gospel, you can have that too. Everybody can have that. If you need to be baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away based upon your faith in Jesus Christ, like the Bible says in Acts 2.38 and Mark 16.16, 16, we hope that you'll do that very thing tonight if you're an accountable person. Or if it is the case that you look at your life and you say, I want to do better, I want to be stronger. Or I have sins that are troubling me. I don't feel like I've lived as a powerful Christian soldier. We pray that you'll come forward this night. We'll have prayer with you. Be honored to do that. Jesus, the great physician, he heals, he helps us. He takes care of all of our problems. Are you washed in the blood? That's our song of invitation, I believe, tonight. And that's a powerful question. If you've not been, that would be a wonderful time for you to do that very thing. We invite you to come to Jesus now. Let's all stand and sing together. <laughs>